Welcome to Practice DNA, the podcast that teaches you how to set up, build and run your own practice. Sponsored by Icon Practice Practice Management Software, get anywhere access to your system while saving thousands in upfront costs. Visit iconpractice.com now. Hi. I'm your host, Matthew Holmes, and this is episode 7 of Practice DNA, the podcast that helps you set up and run your own practice. Today I'm really privileged to be interviewing Shane McFarlane from aliveaccountants.com.au. So let's get straight to it and get into the interview. I'm very pleased today to be able to interview um, Shane McFarlane from Live Accounting at liveaccountants.com.au. Uh, Shane's a former partner at a Business Review Weekly Top 100 accounting practice and established live accountancy, uh, life accounting, beg your pardon, after spending some years abroad working for MYOB Accounting Resourcing. Uh, you've worked with many practitioners over the years and helped them grow their business. Uh, I believe that's true, Shane? That yep, amazing? absolutely. Matthew, yes. thanks, thanks very much for having me here. I um, really appreciate that, uh, the opportunity to, to share a, a little bit of knowledge about um, uh, about business and and really about the adoption of technology in business as well, because I'm sure we're going to touch on that. Mm, yes. No, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on Practice DNA, so thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, so today we're going to talk about business structures, and normally I'd start off by saying something like, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. Now, you're obviously an accountant, but I imagine much of the advice that we're going to discuss today is, is pretty generic in nature, and therefore people should make sure they get their own professional advice. Yeah, absolutely. So technically, it's not not actually advice that we will be giving, but we'll be giving general information. And um, cool. whilst uh, you know this will help to give your um, your, your listeners a, an idea as to the various structures that are available and in the, in the ins and outs of each structure, um, you should always seek professional advice. So you certainly shouldn't seek to rely on any uh, anything that we actually discuss here today. It's really just going to provide a good starting point for a discussion with a professional advisor. Excellent. Good. So uh, there's really three main structures uh, people can sort of look at, isn't there? There's sole trader, partnership or company. Um, yeah. How do you want to start off? Do you want to sort of maybe well, run through? Yeah, well, let's, let's just have a quick overview of those structures. So in fact, there's four. So uh, sole trader, partnership, trust or a company. And then under trust, there's two types of trusts. But um, for simplicity's sake, we'll, we'll just stick with a standard family trust. Right. So um, first of all, the... The, the structures, the sole trader structure is probably the easiest to begin with. Um, so this is just simply an individual that chooses to, to be in business, no partners um, and no formal uh, documents necessarily prepared, such as, uh, you know, company documents or so forth. So it's just a, an individual trader that decides to get an ABN and operate a business. So common forms of business might be, um, you know, tradies such as, you know, plumbers, uh, gardeners, you know, builders, all of that sort of thing. In terms of um, uh, a sole trader, a sole trader is categorized by, um, uh, first of all, a sole trader cannot pay a salary to themselves because you can't employ yourself. Uh, All that happens is any profit that the business is made passes straight to the individual. Now, that's great on on one hand, um, but in terms of, so from a, a tax perspective, from a profit perspective, it's actually a very simple structure. But uh, often with simple structures, there's a downside when it comes to liability. So from a liability perspective, if you're operating as a sole practitioner, whether it be a chiropractic practice, a medical practice, an an accountant, or as a tradie, or anything else, um, the the liability tends to be the bigger issue. If you're in a business that is particularly litigious, then you don't actually have any protection as a sole trader. So... um, you know, if you're, it's not to say that you shouldn't consider op- operating as a sole trader. It just means that you should take appropriate steps to minimise risk, and one of those things would be to make sure you've got appropriate insurance. Mm. Um, so, what happens is, as a sole trader, basically, um, if I conduct a uh, an, an act uh, that re- causes me to be sued, not only could I be personally liable, but any asset that I ho- uh, that I own is potentially at risk. So even if it's a, not a business asset, so I now own my home, um, it's not just my business assets, such as my business motor vehicle or other business tools that, that are subjected to, to risk that I'll have to sell if, I have to, if I'm sued, but I could potentially lose what I consider to be my private assets, such as maybe my home, some personal shares that I might own, a cash in personal bank accounts. All right, So there's no protection 
um, at at that level. Right. Okay. Yeah, I believe uh, some people get around that by doing things like putting all their house in their spouse's name and, and things like that. Um, yep. But uh, that's obviously a fairly drastic step, I suppose. It is a drastic step, but I mean, in the past, that used to be a strategy that we would use. Um, what would, uh, but what's basically happened with the bankruptcy laws is the bankruptcy laws means that those can be clawed back if it's occurred within a certain period of time prior to the event. Right. So um, I think if it's been a long standing, uh, I mean, and I'm not exactly sure on the timelines in, in, in relation to this, so I'm not actually a bankruptcy lawyer or a um, or a bank's bankruptcy professional, but um, yeah, I believe that it can be clawed back. So, you know, if I transfer the, the the house into my wife's name and two years later start a business and the business goes bankrupt for whatever reason, I believe that it can be clawed back. Um, right. But I'm just not sure what that time frame is. Mm, okay. So, but. So when we're looking at, it's, I'll get back to the structures as well, Matthew, because when we're looking, I've described a sole practitioner. So 100% of the profits are yours, 100% of the liability is yours. Yeah. When we look at a partnership, which is sort of the the next most complicated structure beyond that, it's very similar um, with, with added complications. So a partnership is, um, uh, you and I might go into partnership we might uh, say we might have a partners agreement that says you, you'll receive 50% of the profits and I will as well. Yep. Again, technically, uh, we can't pay salaries to ourselves. We just simply share in the profits 50-50. And technically, we also share in any liabilities 50-50, except um, partnership means that every individual partner is actually jointly and severally liable for any act of the partnership. So that's a probably a more technical way to describe it. But what it means non-technically is yeah. that if you you can bind any decision that you make can bind the partnership and affect me. So I might have absolutely no knowledge of a particular transaction. You might go to um, uh, go to you know Ferrari in the center of ta- center of town and lease five Ferraris, um, and one for each of your family members in the business name. Yeah. I might have absolutely no knowledge of it. We can't afford the repayments. Business goes bankrupt. I'm jointly and severally liable for your decision in that regard. Right. Okay? So, so there's an added risk involved with a partnership in that one party, one partner has the ability to bind the other party in a decision. Mm. Okay. So aside from the other risks as well, um, you know, as a partner, if, I, if we're sued, then my personal assets are at risk, your personal assets are at risk, as long as, as well as the business and the business assets. I, I also have another risk in that I can't necessarily control everything you do, but I'm responsible for everything that you do and vice versa. If I make that decision with the five Ferraris, potentially that puts you at risk. So you need, again, to take appropriate steps. You want appropriate insurance. You want appropriate partnerships agreements in place. Yeah. But even if you've got a partnership agreement in place um, that says that I indemnify you for any decision, wrong decision that I make, perhaps. As far, that's an internal agreement. It doesn't necessarily protect you from the party that's wrong. So, you know, if it, the, in that case, with the Ferraris, the leasing company would still come after you, notwithstanding that you have an agreement with me. Right. Okay, so there's that sort of risk involved in a partnership. Mm. So I imagine, therefore, that... Uh for most people, that's not not much of a structure to go for, I wouldn't have thought. Look, it, it's, it's certainly a valid structure and there's plenty of partnerships and it depends on the, on the circumstances. So partnerships, um, you know, it might be the most common partnership we see is a family partnership between husband and wife. Right. Um, and, and that's a perfectly legitimate structure. Um, the other reasons why you might have a partnership, notwithstanding these risks, is, you know, you might have a very good relationship with the partner. And um, you might need access to capital. So, for example, I might only have $100,000 needed to start a business, but by partnering with somebody, I might get access to a further $100,000, um, you know, so more funding, more capital, you're sharing the resources and time. And depending on each person's individual circumstances, they may weigh up the risk to say, well, it's well worth us doing that.